Good evening, afternoon, or morning. Welcome and thank you for joining us as we celebrate Darwin Day and the teaching and learning about science and evolution. I'm Tara Jo Holmberg, the 2023 president of the National Association of Biology Teachers. Before we begin, I wanna take a moment to recognize that I am situated within the traditional territory of the Wappinger Confederacy of Tribes. I am honored to live and work in Torrington, Connecticut, a land with a rich indigenous history and present that includes the Mohican and Pogusset peoples. As we spend our time learning together today, let us also reflect upon and honor the contributions and cultures of the indigenous people who walked in the places we know as home long before we were here. I wanna thank the National Center for Science Education, NCSE, for coordinating this webinar with NABT. While we have partnered together for many years, this is the third year we have partnered with NCSE to present a free Darwin Day event for our community. Remember to stay online for the entire lesson as we have wonderful prizes to give away at the end of the webinar. We have a one-year membership to NABT, a signed Neil Shubin, Your Inner Fish book, a Darwin and Exceptional Voyage graphic novel, New Climate War signed by Michael Mann, Water Bottle from NCSE, Science Makes You Stronger t-shirt and poster, and a variety of magnet stickers and pins. And on that note, I would like to sincerely welcome Lynn Andrews, Director of Teacher Support at NCSE, to introduce tonight's exciting program. Hello to everyone. It's excellent to see you guys tonight. And I am just maneuvering a few things around. So first thing I wanna make sure is that I'm actually sharing. Can everybody see okay, I hope. Um, okay. All right. So welcome to the Darwin Day Evolution Symposium 2023. Um, we are here today to celebrate an annual event that brings attention to the unifying theme of biology. And it's an extremely important event to all of us because often in um, society, this is a controversial topic, but not scientifically. One moment. So with that being said, we always like to start off our presentations by discussing a little bit of the research NCSE has been doing over the past 40 years. My organization um, has been at the forefront of making sure that sound science is taught in the classroom. And as the director of teacher support, I wanted you guys to know that in the past 12 years, we have made some amazing progress. However, even with that being said, 33% of teachers are not teaching evolution as settled science. We have a lot more work to do. And in case you thought that that wasn't accurate, we still have on the books four states that have anti-evolution or anti-science-esque laws. Um, the only one that I want to make note of right now is that in Louisiana, while it's still on the books that they have to give equal time for creation science, thanks to the SCOTUS or the Supreme Court verdict on Edwards versus Aguilera, uh, Aguilard in 1987, that is no longer uh, seen as constitutional, but they have not removed it from the, L the Louisiana legislation legislative law book. And so therefore, they're hoping that one day it can be repealed. One other note to mention is that both Alabama and um, Indiana have non-binding pieces in their law um, resolutions as well. However, currently right now, we're starting to see a new smattering of bills pop up on the various legislative sessions that are occurring. And there are three out of the gate, one in Montana, Oklahoma, and Texas that are all looking to weaken science once more. Some of them are tied into critical race theory uh, bills, but others are very much targeted at science in general. So with that being said, we really feel like these types of presentations are important to remind everyone how important the theory of evolution is and how misunderstood it is often um, in everyday communities. My program and my teacher support group, we have been for the past five years 
looking at how can we help students and teachers break down these very sticky misconceptions that occur in the classroom. For example, evolution is just the theory. That one pops up still constantly. You can see it in the legislature that they are wanting to discredit theories, not understanding that theories are very different in the scientific community. So we have developed um, kind of what we call a tri- um, a triangular scope of how we want to approach this. We want it to be no conflict, but we want to be based in research and we want it to have the foundation of the NGSS standards. And so all of the different pieces that we have developed fall in that purview. Now, as uh, TJ already mentioned, at the end, we're going to be having a preview of an amazing lesson that is directly correlated to Miss Larissa DeSantis's work, Dr. Larissa DeSantis's work, and we also have a great prize to give out. So it is my honor to get to introduce to you tonight, Dr. Larissa G. Um, R. G. DeSantis. And she is from the University of Vanderbilt. Tennessee is my home state, so I'm very, very fond of the Vanderbilt School. And she has been doing research with many um, amazing scientists on the mammals, their diets, dentition, and how all of this is tied into the changes we've seen over time in both climate and these organisms um, throughout um, throughout their time on the planet. Obviously, they're still they're extinct now. So I'm going to hand it over to Dr. DeSantis, and I hope you guys enjoy her presentation as much as we've enjoyed getting to work with her the past couple of months. Great, thank you so much, Lynn. I appreciate that. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen. Oh, I need to stop sharing. Let's see. Share screen. Okay. So Can everyone... you are, there you go. Okay, perfect. All right. So thank you so much um, to both uh, NCSC and also um, the, the American Biology Teachers Association. Um, it's so wonderful to be able to, to speak to you today about some of the, the fun and exciting research that we get to do and to celebrate Darwin Day. So happy Darwin Day um, today, or in a few days, uh, on February 12th, uh, it will be 214 years since the birth of Charles Darwin um, and 164 years since uh, he published On the Origin of Species. And obviously Darwin is known uh, internationally for helping us understand evolutionary processes, how things came to be, um, how natural the, the sort of um, mode of evolution, right? So change over time via natural selection. And these are just a example of some of the Darwin Day events uh, that I've seen um, advertised uh, here. And so everyone is sort of celebrating his contributions. I think that's very important. Um, I also think it's a really nice moment to sort of recognize some of the hidden figures within paleontology. And, and one of those is Mary Anning. Um, and she was uh, is credited as being um, one of the first paleontologists who excavated various things like plesiosaurs and ichthyosaurs. Uh, there's a really wonderful article written about her by uh, NCSE. So I think they're gonna sort of tweet that out. Um, but today we're gonna sort of build off of, you know, the importance of fossils uh, that, that Darwin recognized. So Darwin was, you know, traveling the world, collecting specimens. He collected fossils as well. Uh, he understood that the diversity of life on earth came about through um, natural selection. And one thing I think is, is really important is since his birth, since his publication of The Origin of the Species, um, really we can now use fossils in a whole different way. So it used to be we were just sort of interested and excited about learning um, about our own evolutionary history or how things came to be. Uh, but now we can actually use fossils to discover ecological and evolutionary responses to global change and actually to apply this knowledge to conserve species and ecosystems. And so there's now a field called conservation paleobiology where we can actually, again, put that, that fossil record to work and begin to understand how we can best conserve or manage populations today. And as of uh, last year around this time, 
the Conservation Paleobiology Network had uh, close to 600 members across 46 countries, and I'm guessing it's grown obviously since then as well. But it's, these are all the people who are using the fossil record in a diversity of ways to help us think about and conserve the future. So one of the ways in which our lab tries to understand um, the world today and the world of the past is to actually clarify biotic responses to climate change. And as we are all aware, uh, and in the words of Barack Obama, climate change is no longer some far off problem. It is happening here and it is happening now. And this can be in the form of uh, increased intensity of storm events, increased wildfire activity, um, dramatic swings in, in uh, you know, recently the Northeast had uh, really extreme negative temperatures, wind chills that approached or went close to negative 100, which is, which is just shocking. I can't even perceive of that. Um, and other places that are facing record high temperatures in Australia uh, currently. So you may wonder why paleontology? How can paleontology help us understand climate change, how things have changed over time, and even how we might want to manage uh, species in the future? Um, so if I wanted to study this jaguar, for example, and I am an ecologist or conservation biologist, and these are very, very important disciplines, so I don't want to underscore the importance of these disciplines. Um, they are extremely necessary as well. But it's, it's challenging. If I want to study this jaguar, I have to go out, maybe monitor its population over the next year, over the next three years. Maybe I get a five-year grant. Uh, maybe I'm able to extend that grant into 10 years. Maybe I establish a long-term ecological research station and myself and colleagues are measuring various attributes about the environment or plants and animals and where this jaguar or these jaguar populations live. Um, and Ideally, we can do that for some period of time, but we have to wait for that time to pass uh, to really be able to understand or assess the impacts of uh, current climate change. However, with paleontology, we can essentially extend that time axis. So we can go back in time and look at periods of dramatic climate change and begin to see how different mammals may have responded and what lessons we can learn. So my lab is primarily focused on diet. Uh, and people often wonder, why do you care what an animal ate? Why is diet so important? And diet is really a critical piece to almost everything an animal does. So for example, if we take a look at this uh, super cute koala up here, um, this koala is going to be eating eucalyptus leaves. Uh, it needs a eucalyptus forest. It needs the eucalyptus trees that it can live in. Um, and so its diet directly impacts where it lives and what kind of ecosystem. We can also impact how an animal moves across their environment. So we have our wildebeest over here and they're doing their, their migrations and tracking resources that are available, the grasses uh, throughout uh, different parts of the season. Um, so it affects how they move across their landscape. Diet can also influence biomechanics of an animal. So this cheetah here and how it's hunting this rabbit, um, its ability to move uh, very fast in one direction is an example of um, how diet affects the biomechanics of this animal, the ability for it to actually capture its prey. It has to be able, whether it's running fast like a cheetah or ambush hunting, uh, maybe like a tiger, these are different strategies, their diet is going to influence what they do, how they move in their shape and form. And then lastly, but not least, it can even influence reproduction, how often the animal reproduces, how many times a, a year, if it's once a year, multiple times during the year, there, there have to be adequate resources available. And it can even influence various mechanisms for reproduction as well. So our lab um, is called the DREAM Lab, which stands for Dietary Reconstructions and Ecological Assessments of Mammals. Uh, so it's a bit of a mouthful, but we are focused on the diets of these, of these animals. And essentially, before we can look at any mammals from the past, we have to get a better sense of what these animals are doing today. And so these are all, or just actually just an example of some of the, the modern animals that we're studying. And we have to make sure the tools that we use, that we take back into the fossil record, actually apply. Um, and so that's one of our motivations for studying the modern animals. But I will say in recent years, we've actually began 
uh, or begun to start looking at historic um, specimens. So we can look at polar bears over the last hundred years or wolf diets over the last hundred years and begin to see how they are uh, being impacted by current climate change as well. So these are the many fossil ecosystems in which I work. And some of my favorite are, are up here. So here we have um, Rancho La Brea, which is depicted in with the yellow stars. We have some ecosystems in Florida. You have things like giant ground sloths and, and the terror birds. Um, the, the, these are both located in Australia. And I'll be talking quite a bit about Australia and La Brea actually today. And then some work also in the Arctic. But we work with mammalian communities. So we're looking at how are all of these mammals responding to various changes? And are there lessons that we can extract that are of relevance today? So I would love a time machine or a time turner, um, but short of that, uh, we need these proxy methods so that we can actually go back in time and infer diet and hence environment, and also in many cases, um, precise information about the climate from these methods. So a few of these methods are noted here. Um, we can look at the morphology or the sort of size and shape of these teeth. We can see that they're fairly flat. This animal is likely eating plants. Um, we can measure the jaw uh, and tell different things about its morphology. We can also look at sort of the gross shape of these teeth. So are they sharp cusps? Do they have rounded cusps or do they have blunt cusps? And these can correspond to different um, diets over time. So an animal that's eating lots of grass, it's going to wear down its teeth. They're going to be very blunt. Whereas something that's shearing leaves, you're going to get sort of these pointy or sharper cusps. Now in my lab, we also specialize in um, other methods, including stable isotope analysis, which is actually using the uh, stable isotopes in plants and the fact that C3 and C4 plants photosynthesize differently to be able to capture information about what kind of vegetation these animals are actually eating. And we can also get information from what's called dental microwear texture analysis, from the microscopic wear patterns left on teeth from the processing of different types of foods. So essentially, you are what you eat. Everything you eat is incorporated into your tissues. That can be your um, your bones, your teeth, your skin, even your breath, uh, your blood, your organs. So everything, your hair, uh, is incorporating um, something about your diet. And the great thing about bones and teeth, and especially teeth, is that they are um, resilient within the fossil record. Uh, they persist. They are often preserved at fossil localities. And with, with teeth in particular, they're highly inorganic. Um, so they are less likely to be altered uh, over time. And so we can actually look at the isotopes from the teeth themselves. So drill the, the animal teeth, analyze those isotopes and get an idea of what these animals were eating in the past. So in particular, um, we can get at whether an animal was eating C3 trees and shrubs or C4 grasses. Oh, let me over here, C3 trees and shrubs or C4 grasses. And in places like Florida or East Africa or certain um, uh, sort of mid-latitude uh, type environments, equatorial regions, C4, or C4 resources tend to be grasses and C3 resources tend to be trees and shrubs. So we can use isotopes alone many times to infer diet of various animals. However, in places uh, like Australia, you actually have a whole mix of, of various resources. There's not only C4 grasses, but there are C4 shrubs. Uh, and there, you can also have C3 trees and shrubs and C3 grasses. And in places that are at high latitudes, um, places like Europe or the Arctic, you're just dealing with the C3 ecosystem. So often we have to have that other tool that can help parse um, what or something is eating grass or browse. The other really neat thing about isotopes is we can actually get at forest density. So essentially what happens is in a really dense forest, um, you basically have really negative values as compared to a slightly more open forest. And so we can begin to even reconstruct was this animal hanging out in the dense part of the forest or a more open part of the forest within that sort of forested community. So there's lots of amazing information we can get from the teeth. 
Uh, so we can look at the microscopic wear patterns on these teeth as well. And this is a method that's been used for decades. In fact, it's been used since the 1970s. Um, and it used to be that you would use a scanning electron microscope where you would take an image of a surface and then uh, humans, <laughs> we would proceed to, you know, count the various scratches and pits on a surface um, and then quantify that. Now, as fun as this sounds, uh, it's also a little bit problematic in the sense that we're, we're pretty good at counting scratches, um, but we're not so great at counting pits, right? So like, is this one pit or is this two pits? Is this one pit? Are these several different pits? And so long story short, um, a new method was developed um, by Peter Unger and colleagues, um, which uses sort of it assesses dental microwear in three dimensions. So instead of looking at something in 2D, we're actually quantifying it in 3D and analyzing that surface much like you would anal analyze a topographic map. So some of the key features that um, we use when analyzing dental microwear are anisotropy. And so anisotropy is um, the degree to which features with similar reliefs or similar orientation. So if you, lots of scratches, for example, we tend to see in grazing bovids, in filivorous sloths, in pandas that are eating tough foods, or even cheetahs that are eating tough flesh. Complexity is a little bit different. So to, to get your hands around um, complexity, what I want you to think of is we're all going to be in a space shuttle for the moment, and we're looking down at Earth, and Earth is extremely smooth. And as we get closer and closer to the surface of the Earth, it's going to get more and more complex, and we're going to start to see mountains and valleys and, and various bits of topography. And so we know that relationship is always going to happen, but we can actually quantify that relationship. And the slope of that relationship is essentially our complexity value. So um, how complex a surface is, and we tend to get high complexity in things that are eating bone like hyenas, lots of insects uh, like armadillos, or even eating lots of fruits that might have hard seeds or pits in them like a taper um, or other or various primates. So using these various tools, our lab is really interested in, in essentially asking how has climate change affected mammalian communities and their floral environments in the past? What are some of the consequences of past climate change? What are some of the consequences of extinction on survivors? And what cautionary lessons can we apply to conservation? So we're gonna start off in Australia. Uh, many of us are in, in winter, um, but those in Australia are in summer at the moment. Um, and Australia is um, one of the hottest and driest places uh, on earth, or it can be at times. Um, and so one of the things that we want to know is what are the effects of aridification in Australia in the past and also in the present? And essentially, Australia is serving a little bit like a canary in the coal mine. It's telling us if um, sort of what the consequences are of getting really, really hot or really, really dry or both. Um, and what we might expect when, when other regions on earth um, do this as well. And, and Australia, I just wanna mention, most of Australia is dealing with a Mediterranean climate or large parts of it are dealing with a Mediterranean climate, which is very similar to Southern California, places like South Africa, places in France. Um, and so this is a really good model for understanding um, some of this dramatic climate change. It's also can be some of the most extreme changes. So we're really looking at some of the larger impacts. And this was an article from today, although if anyone's chiming in from Australia, it's actually technically yesterday because you're in tomorrow. Um, but essentially this weekend, um, there are going to be scorching temperatures. And you can see, if you look at this key here, this is in degrees Celsius, which um, uh, so neg uh, negative five to 45, and you can see that there are areas above 45 degrees Celsius projected for this weekend and large areas above 40 degrees Celsius. So that is um, pretty extreme um, weather that we're dealing with even currently. So one of the, the sort of first projects that I, I did in Australia was really trying to understand the impacts of climate change on a broad group of mammals. And so um, before I go any further, I just want to make sure I give proper credit to Dr. Jude Field. She is really the one who has studied Cuddy Springs for decades. Um, she has excavated 
uh, the site and, and, um, and trained many generations of researchers in different archaeological methods and essentially has accumulated lots of fossils from sort of an older horizon, so about 400,000 years in age, and a more recent horizon, about 30 to 40,000 years, that actually co-occurs with people uh, in Australia. And so we can begin to look at these two different time periods to see if and how mammals are changing in response to uh, various climatic changes. We can also assess what those climatic changes actually are. Okay, so one of the ways we can do this is we can look at kangaroos. So from studying modern kangaroos, um, we know that kangaroos are really good at tracking relative humidity. And so if you look at kangaroos in low rainfall regions today, these orange boxes, or in high rainfall regions, these blue boxes, you can see that their auction isotope values are very different. Um, and so oxygen isotopes actually uh, increase when you have increased aridity uh, in this system. And so we can actually look at our fossil kangaroos from Cuddy Springs from the pre-archaeological horizon and the archaeological horizon. And what we find is, is we're not going from, you know, a wet period to a dry period. We're actually going from a fairly dry period to a drier period. So we're seeing aridification occur via these kangaroos. We can also get an incredible amount of information from um, actually taking sequential samples along the uh, tooth. So this is a lower incisor of a diprotodon, which is a giant wombat-like animal about the size of a rhinoceros. It's very neat, very fun uh, megafauna um, taxon, one of my favorites. Um, but anyways, here you've got all of these serial samples that we can actually take um, as the, the tooth enamel is being laid down. So over the growth of this animal and over a period of you know, two or more years, um, they're actually recording not only the food that they're eating, but also the environment that they're, they're living in, the water that they're drinking. And so if we actually look at the pre-archaeological versus the archaeological horizons, we can see that both have a relatively seasonal climate. So you've got periods of aridity and then periods that might be wetter, and then it kind of goes up and you've got periods of aridity and maybe a wetter period. We don't see dramatic changes between these two intervals so much, but we do see that they are dealing with a fairly seasonal climate. The other thing we can do is begin to test just general hypotheses about the morphology of animals. So um, up until this point, um, we assume that our uh, macropus taxa are grazers, and that's because a lot of macropus taxa today are grazers. Oop. Let me go backwards. There. Oop. Sorry about that. Um, then we have our um, uh, forest browsers, this thing called protemnodon. And then it was assumed that uh, Stenurus, or different species of Stenurus, were in fact these sort of open country mixed feeders based on their morphology. And that's just kind of draw, trying to draw similarities between animals that are alive today and what they do and their shapes of their bones and animals alive in the past. But interestingly, when we actually look at their isotopes, what we find is that Macropus is in fact eating some grass and some other resources. Protemnodon is eating forested resources, but Cinerus is actually eating within the densest part of the forest. So the more negative the values, the denser the forest. Um, and then interestingly, if we look over time, we find that some of these texts are actually declining in their Delta 13C values. So we actually looked at all of the animals in the community. Um, and here we've got everything from our Diprotodons, this is another wombat-like animal close to rhino size called Zygomaturus. We've got various different kangaroos and wombats in these communities. And what you can see is kind of what their diet is based on their stable carbon isotope values. And interestingly, um, through this time, we sort of see a, a lack of values that fall into this like orange space here, right? So we're actually seeing a decline in C4 consumption. And this is sort of, this is, this is pretty interesting. Um, and we weren't the first ones to discover this. In fact, there had been a paper published in 2005 by Gifford Miller, 
And they had looked at eggshell stable isotopes at sites that were younger than 45,000 years and older than 50,000 years, and also wombat teeth. And if you look at everything that's older, so all of these egg, all this eggshell data here and the, the wombat teeth here, and then you compare it directly to sites that are a bit younger, you're going to start to notice less of these more positive values, right? So less C4 resources are being consumed by these wombats, less C4 resources are being consumed um, by even some of these birds. So something is happening in this ecosystem. And this is unusual um, because when we were studying ecosystems in Florida, for example, going from a glacial to an interglacial period, what we actually see is an expansion of C4 resources. As you go from sort of a cooler interval to this sort of warmer interval, you get more of a mosaic of, of habitats. You get large amounts of, of mammoths and gompotheres that are able to kind of live in these um, grassland environments. You also have lots of horses, lots of things that are actually mixed feeding, things like various camelids or peccaries, and then things that are, are browsing. Um, but you see an expansion of the consumption of C4 resources. So when grasses become prevalent or the C4 grasses become prevalent, more things are eating them. So it was sort of strange that we find that um, we see this decline in uh, C4 consumption in Australia. And that got us thinking, what is this C4 resource? And so if you remember that C4 resources could be grasses, but they could also be shrubs. What those shrubs are that are C4 typically is a shrub called saltbush. Um, so there is a, a group of um, plants that essentially have salt, like the name implies, um, but are shrubs. And if we look at the microscopic wear patterns of our living grazing kangaroos, more of our like mixed feeding kangaroos, our browsing quokka, and our browsing mixed feeding wallaby, um, what we see is that um, there's many more pits on these surfaces, and these are all more consistent with sort of a browsing diet as opposed to a grazing diet. And we can quanti we quantify this as well by looking at the 3D textures. Um, and this is really interesting because um, previously, back in 2009, uh, Gavin Perdo uh, and a group of, of folks, in including myself, were we're curious about this animal, Procopton galaya. And it was actually um, sort of a product of a, of a tea time conversation in Australia, which I, I very much miss the sort of tea time culture of everyone um, sort of getting together and discussing science. Hopefully we'll, we'll restart that at some point. But, um, but anyways, in this conversation, he was saying, huh, it's really strange. Um, I have these these kangaroos that kind of shift between having more negative values in temperate forests, more positive values in arid areas, and, and definitely more positive values in subtropical regions. But this Percopton galaya always has positive delta 13c values. And so this actually indicated that it was eating saltbush, which is, also has positive delta 13c values or, or values that are more positive than, um, than the, the C3 values. And when we looked at the microware, in fact, that's what we found, that in fact, it was eating saltbush. And so if you have a large number of animals or any animals that are, are primarily eating saltbush, um, this is going to make those animals more vulnerable to climatic changes that are happening. And that's because, as you can imagine, if you're eating something with lots of salt, you have to drink lots of water. And in fact, we can see that in the auction values here. So these are auction values of kangaroos that lived alongside Procopton galaya from the same site. And you can see that these Procopton galaya values are actually more negative than these kangaroos. And that's because they're having to drink more water. So whether it's because these watering holes are fewer and far between, or whether you know, accessing water is a dangerous venture, i.e. You know, humans predating or chompy things like this, this crocodile, um, being reliant on these watering sources um, is, is sort of a, a negative effect of eating of saltbush. And so what we essentially think is happening is that a lot of these animals are having to kind of start competing for similar resources, stop eating that saltbush, 
and that climate really did sort of stress um, some of these populations. So we can't say anything about the role of humans um, in this study, but we can say that uh, climate and subsequent ecological change could be a potential cause of megafaunal extinctions. Now, interestingly, as, as all science um, does, you know, there's lots of debates over um, what's the causal factors of the extinction in Australia. And in fact, just, a, you know, it took us about a decade to actually get this study done between gathering all the data and, and uh, of all these different methods and, and all agreeing on the paper together um, and going through the review process. Uh, a few weeks prior, a paper came out and said humans, rather than climate change, cause megafaunal extinctions here. Our paper came out and said, well, we can't speak to humans, but it looks like with a increased aridification, these animals are having to switch their diets away from things like saltbush, potentially having to compete more for resources and stressing them. The other thing was a few weeks later, um, another site, so at the time, Cuddy Springs was the only mainland site that showed the co-occurrence of megafauna and um, humans. And so there was another site that was actually discovered that showed co-occurrence of humans and megafauna for about 17,000 years. Um, and then additionally, uh, a few weeks later, a paper came out showing that human occupation might have been even early around 65,000. So why does this all matter? Well, there are different iterations and different causal factors to what have, might have caused the extinction of these animals. It can be human overkill, um, which is they killed them uh, gradually, or blitzkrieg, where they killed them all within a very short interval of time, say a thousand years. Other ideas about humans sort of altering the environment via fire, perhaps, or uh, climate change and other paleoecological factors. This shows it's a, it's a little bit complicated, um, but that climate may have been a stressor. Now, I really like this diagram here, which goes to show potential causes of extinction. Now, I will say this is from 2004, so things have been you know updated in our way of thinking since then. But what I really like about this figure, and this figure is by Tony Bernowski and colleagues, is that it shows that, say, in Europe, you have climate as a major driver of extinctions, but humans played a role as well. Whereas in North America, humans may have played a larger role, whereas climate might have also been sort of providing this tipping point. Um, the only place I would disagree is I probably would have colored this diprotodon brown at the time for insufficient data. But now with the, the increased data that we're getting, it's looking like climate may have in fact been a, a major driver. So on that note, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about one of the coolest animals um, I think there is ever. <laughs> and this is called the marsupial lion. Um, some people refer to it actually as the killer wombat because it evolved from an herbivorous group of animals much like the herbivorous panda evolved from a carnivorous group. This was an herbivorous, I mean, a carnivorous animal that evolved from an herbivorous group. Um, and it was quite an incredible animal. Um, so this is not a broken tooth. These are actually two teeth that form one shearing facet here. And their teeth are essentially like bolt cutters, right? They can chomp and chew on whatever they want. Um, their bite force is 80% that of an extant lion's, um, despite being only about 30 to 50% of their body mass. And their postcranial morphology, uh, so the morphology, the shape of their bones behind their skull, is much more bear-like, um, even similar to um, bears, saber-toothed cats, than it is to um, things that are or things that are chasing down prey. So this was sort of an ambush hunter. And, and most of this work here was done by Steve Rowe at the University of Newcastle. So what we've done since is really try to understand the paleobiology of this animal. We know what it could do, but what did it actually do during its life? And so to do that, we looked at a range of different animals. We looked at um, the marsupial lion from throughout um, all the states and territories that we could. Uh, we also uh, isotopically sampled them as well um, and looked at some of the co-occurring um, uh, prey or the co-occurring predators that they lived with. Now, before we can do any of this work, 
Um, what's really important is that we establish that these methods work. Um, so for example, we had previously looked at cheetah microware, lion microware, and hyena microware. And what you can see here is that the cheetahs, which are avoiding bone, have sort of low complexity values and variable anisotropy values. Here, we've got hyenas in blue that are actively consuming bone, and they can have really high complexity values. And then our lions are sort of in between, they're moderate. So if we compare these to thiacaleo, we in fact see thiacaleo could pretty much eat whatever it wanted. It's falling into the space of, of cheetahs, lions, and hyenas. It could eat hard things. But what was really interesting is that thiacaleo seems to be a specialist on C3 prey. So it's in fact consuming only things from the densest part of the forest. So if we look at all of the different co-occurring herbivores. So we've kind of color-coded these. Again, remember we've got C3 grasses and C4 grasses and C3 shrubs and C4 shrubs. So if it's blue, they're browsing or eating leaves. If they're green, they're grazing. Sometimes uh, we can have these values that are lower than these values. These are mixed feeding, but some of this is salt bush. But we have all these different herbivores living in this community. And what we essentially find is that this individual or these individuals here, these are um, uh, pretended on, they live in the forest. Here's an example of one here, uh, but that Thiacaleo was likely sort of hunting them from the treetops. It was hunting the things in the forest. Now to make sure that this wasn't, you know, Thiacaleo wasn't just doing this in one place, in one locality, um, we looked at Thiacaleo from all across its range, all across Australia. And when we do that, we see some variability in the different populations, whether you're in South Australia or whether you're in Queensland, but all of these values are less than negative 10. These are all values we would expect of things that reside within a forest. So what that tells us, why this is important, is that this formidable predator that could chomp on whatever it wanted was highly reliant on ambushing um, forest dwelling prey. And so it was able to, to capture prey that lived in the forest, likely from the treetops. And that as these trees begin to uh, decline in their, their uh, abundance on the landscape, as you have aridification coming into the ecosystem, um, these animals may have been less able to hunt effectively. And so even though they are at the top of the food chain, they are one of the most vulnerable to climate change and ultimately go extinct. So I think this is a really sort of important um, take home point. It's also, you know, up to this point, we've talked a little bit about um, the impacts in Australia, but what we can see is that there's a, a decline in native saltbush consumers, increased competition for resources and ridification. And that again, the marsupial lions can't effectively kill or hunt prey um, in these, um, uh, as the forests are opening up. So we can kind of pull that together in a conservation message, which is that climate change, including ridification, was a likely driver of animal extinctions. Um, and there's a lot more that we need to learn about these animals. We're just sort of scratching the surface of what we can learn about the paleobiology of these animals. Now, the reason it's really important to understand the paleobiology of animals is we often will use predictions or um, assessments of what an animal does to project what they might do into the future. So for example, um, there's a field in which um, we do what's called niche modeling. So we assume that what an animal does today, an animal will do tomorrow. And we can look at animals from the Pleistocene and project where they should be today. We can look at things from the present and project where they should have been in the Pleistocene. But when we do this, we only are, are correct about 50% of the time. And so part of the challenge is that we make this assumption that what an animal does today, an animal will do tomorrow, but that's not always upheld. In fact, when we begin to look at um, this assumption of niche conservatism, we can find that sometimes these animals are changing and that's potentially why some of these um, projections are actually not as informative as we would hope. 
So together with Dr. Melissa Party, who's at the Illinois State Museum, we're trying to work on ways in which we can improve these niche models by an understanding of uh, this biological information, this ecological information. Another area where the fossil record has been really important um, is in thinking about making new introductions of various species. So this is Dr. Michael Archer. He's at the University of New South Wales. And he's known for studying amazing fossil localities, but especially one known as Riversley, in which um, there are these uh, ancestors of the mountain pygmy possum that actually lived in very sort of wet lowland environments. Now, I know I can't see a raise of hands, but I am pretty sure if I, if I asked you how many of you um, associated alpine environments with Australia, there would be very few uh, people who would raise their hand. And that's because um, these alpine environments are few and far between. Um, they're, they're very restricted and with climate change expected to disappear entirely. Um, so the mountain pygmy possum, which only lives in these alpine environments in Australia today, um, again, his ancestors have lived in these different environments. So what they're actually doing is he's been working with conservationists to try to rear mountain pygmy possums in, at different um, locations in these sort of more wetland, lowland uh, environments and release them, monitor them, and see how they may do. Okay, um, so other work um, like this uh, can be really useful for understanding sort of how an animal's ecological niche may have changed over time. So this is a quokka. Um, if you if you're looking for one of you know what what animal starts with a Q, I've now given to you quokka, or you could even look at quolls. Um, they have this perpetual smile on their face, uh, which makes them um, attractive for quokka selfies. Um, but essentially, these quokkas are highly endangered species, and they are restricted to living um, in this region of Australia here. And if we sort of blow that up, it looks like they occupy this fairly large area. But I think what's important to mention is there's a very small population on uh, Bald Island here, and that the vast majority of quokkas that are alive uh, between say 10 to 12,000 of a maybe 15,000 um, projected population size all live on this tiny island off the coast of Perth called Rottnest Island. And so um, one of the challenges is sort of reintroducing them um, or um, understanding their ecology just over time in these regions. And so one of the problems is that Europeans brought over lots of invasive species, rabbits, foxes, and that these may in fact be um, either competing with the quokkas in the case of rabbits or in the case of foxes actually uh, using them as prey. And so one of the studies that we did was actually looked at um, the microware and the isotopes of these quokkas. And, and what we found was these animals today, they browse. So these values are consistent with them having a browsing diet, whether that's, you know, um, in the fossil record or in the modern record, whether that's on islands or on the mainland, they're browsers, right? That's that's what they eat leaves. But what's really interesting is when we looked at the isotopes, we found that the fossil quokkas from the mainland used to live in much more open environments than any of the mainland quokkas do today. Now, what this suggests is that the quokkas that are alive today are having to hide from uh, foxes and evade predation and in fact rely on these dense areas to, to have that cover um, where in fact in the past they probably did quite fine with more of a mosaic and so um, if we're able to um, eradicate foxes in this area we don't necessarily need a dense forest for these quokkas to do well. Um, we can actually look at the niche that they had going back a little bit further in time and see that they did pretty well in these mosaic environments. Um, so we've actually written a little children's book about this. So keep posted on our website for when we, when this goes live. Um, but essentially um, we're trying to communicate this story um, of sort of the consequences of invasive species, especially foxes to quokkas um, in, this, in this children's book. All right, so at this point, we're gonna sort of fly from Australia to Los Angeles um, and go to the La Brea Tar Pits. 
The La Brea Tar Pits is also one of my favorite fossil localities. Um, it is considered what's uh, a Lagerstadt, which um, has an abundance of fossils preserved. And this is because it's largely a tar or asphaltum site, in which case an herbivore might get stuck, whether it's you know laying on the surface, whether it's making distress calls or whatever it's doing at that moment, it's going to attract lots of carnivores. And so subsequently, all of those carnivores get trapped as well. So because of this, there's an incredibly rich fossil record of herbivores and carnivores. And we can begin to even look back in time over the last 50,000 years. Um, and the reason why you know, La Brea is so unique is also because typically carnivores are preserved kind of in the relative abundance on the landscape. So if you were to walk outside, you're most likely gonna see grass and trees Maybe if you're lucky, you'll see a deer. Maybe if you're really lucky, you'll see a, a coyote, um, but you're less likely to see those individuals because there's just fewer of them on the landscape, all things being equal. But because of this sort of trap situation, we actually get often a larger number of carnivores than we do herbivores. So we have the luxury of being able to look at these mammalian communities through time. So previous work had sort of looked at the diets of um, dire wolves, saber-toothed cats, and the American lion. And what they had seen is that there was an overlap in the isotopic values when they looked at their carbon and their nitrogen values. And this suggested that they were actually competing for similar prey. Now, since this study, we've actually looked at their enamel-stable isotopes, um, which tell us a little bit of a better picture about their whole diet. And what we actually find is that the saber-toothed cats were sort of eating prey from the forest, whereas the dire wolves were eating things from more open ecosystems. And actually, if you look at this through time, we can actually see that the saber-toothed cats are over here, the dire wolves are over here. Things like bison are much more positive and likely uh, prey items for things like dire wolves, but very unlikely prey items for things like saber-toothed cats. So we would expect these values to be right over the same range of any of these if they were eating these resources. But in fact, the saber-toothed cats might have been eating a larger percentage of things like camels or tapers um, or other such animals and not actually chasing down bison in open environments. So this can actually give us a, a better indication of what these environments were like. And this has led to sort of a, a new vision of La Brea. Uh, this is a beautiful illustration done by Mauricio Antone um, showing the, you know, the dire wolves chasing down the bison, the saber-toothed cats feasting on their forested taper, the coyote sort of in between. Um, but this kind of gives you a, a more comprehensive picture of what La Brea was like. Now, for a long time, we really focused on the things that went extinct, saber-toothed cats, dire wolves, and tried to understand why they might have gone extinct. And there were different hypotheses, such as that they were competing with humans for prey or that things were times were really tough. Um, all of those hypotheses uh, eventually fell to the wayside, and we weren't able to really answer what caused the extinction of these animals. So instead of, of concentrating on the extinct species, what we essentially did is focused on the living species, the things that actually survive this extinction. So we've got our wolves, our coyotes, and our mountain lions that survived this extinction. And I think one thing that's really important to note is that these were all what we call sort of like the, the meso predators. These were the smaller um, predators on the landscape, which eventually became apex predators. What we ended up finding was that cougars um, here are, you see a, a wide range of values. They're actually engaged in scavenging um, and they're highly opportunistic. They're highly opportunistic today. They can eat armadillos, vicuñas, guanacos, um, various uh, uh, deer or even elk, depending on where they, where they live and also who they co-occur with, what other predators are on the landscape. So essentially, the secret to surviving extinction is don't be a picky eater. So you can tell your children this or grandchildren this as well. 
um, having a generalized diet may be very helpful. And, you know, I always like to joke, I'd, I'd like to see a saber tooth cat take down a rabbit, right? Some of these smaller prey are going to be very hard for them to hunt. So all of some of the largest prey, the dire wolves, the saber tooth cats, being large in a sense is a, is a form of specialization. Um, and it's the things that are actually able to be more generalized and opportunistic that seem to survive. Now, we wanted to also take a look at things like coyotes, which we know are really opportunistic today. Um, and, and, so, and to analyze kind of what they were doing. And essentially what we find is that the coyotes here in red um, aren't actually doing what coyotes do today. They're not engaged in any scavenging. They're actually probably eating mainly small mammals. Um, and then our dire wolves are the ones kind of doing everything, including engaging in some sort of scavenging behavior. But now we can begin to look at the, the behavior of these animals, the survivors over time. What were they doing at the time when they lived with all of these large apex predators, dire wolves and saber-toothed cats? And what, were they, what are they doing now? So the wolves are essentially maintaining a very similar diet. So the black ones are from La Brea, the red ones are from modern systems, and they don't seem to change any over time. Now, what's interesting, though, is we've started to look at wolves today in response to modern climate change. And this is work done in conjunction with Dr. Amanda Burt, where we've looked at wolves from Alaska and wolves from Yellowstone, and we see quite a, a sort of a difference. Now, part of the challenge here is that we have um, older specimens from the 50s and 60s from Alaska, and then we have very recent specimens from Yellowstone. However, we don't, we can't look at uh, specimens from the 50s and 60s at Yellowstone because there were no wolves in Yellowstone at that time. But what we can do is look at wolf diets over time in Alaska. And when we've done this, and this is in collaboration with Yugana Abdubha, um, is that we've actually looked at uh, an increase in complexity over time. So these animals are having to potentially scavenge more um, as they sort of climates are warming. And this may have to do with having um, less severe amounts of snow uh, and less um, prey mortality, which is causing some of these animals to having to, to scavenge a bit more, return to carcasses, et cetera. But returning to the coyote, the coyote during the Pleistocene was e eating primarily small things and not engaged in much scavenging. During the Holocene, it's hard to tell, but during the modern, there's a clear picture that it's now engaged in scavenging behavior. And when we look at um, dire wolves here, these pluses, and the coyotes here, these circles over time, we see that with this extinction event, we begin to see sort of the coyotes um, engaged in scavenging thereafter. So one of the challenges in this is we're not just dealing with the extinction of um, the dire wolves between the end of the Pleistocene and the present, we're also dealing with the extirpation of, of gray wolves in the region. And so we wanted to make sure that wasn't a challenge. So what we then did is we looked at gray wolves and coyotes, where they co-occur in Alaska. And we actually find that whether there are gray wolves there or not, uh, doesn't really impact the coyote behavior. In fact, coyotes do great um, with living alongside gray wolves. In fact, many times they will actually follow the gray wolves and then scavenge on the carcasses they leave behind at risk to themselves, um, but it is an, also an effective strategy. Now, interestingly, we can also look at sort of coyote and dire wolves and saber tooth cat diets through time. And one of the interesting thing we find about the coyotes is this really dramatic shift to these negative values in the modern. And this we actually think may be a function of us, right? So now we've uh, largely extirpated wolves from the lower 48. Um, we also are driving automobiles, which um, are creating lots of uh, deer carcasses or roadkill on the side. And that this sort of influx of this resource might be what these coyotes are now doing their scavenging on deer carcasses that are available. Their isotope values are plummeting because deer values are very negative, uh, and they're also beginning to scavenge a bit more. 
So right now we're sort of trying to pull all of this together and, and it's a really exciting time to do work at La Brea. So everything I presented on um, is sort of work that we had done without a lot of radiocarbon dating where we had looked at different pits and different sites through time. But the, the upside of La Brea is all the fossils. The downside of La Brea is that these bones are jumbled together. And so um, what we're actually working on right now as part of a multi-institutional effort, also known as Project Sabre, um, is we are actually taking a lot of information from uh, the specimen. So it used to be um, that if I was studying teeth, I would study isolated teeth so I didn't cause damage to those teeth and someone was radiocarbon dating bones, they would look at um, you know, larger uh, leg bones, for example. But now what we're looking at is we're looking at these jaws and we're able to get a radiocarbon date from the jaw, which can tell us when in time the animal lived. We can get morphological information. So the shape of the jaw can tell us something about how that animal may have been behaving or um, what it was well suited to do. We can also get carbon and nitrogen from its bone collagen and we can get dental microware from its teeth and also carbon and oxygen from its teeth. And so we can then begin to sort of piece together what was the role of climate, humans, et cetera, on the landscape um, and why did some of these animals potentially go extinct and, and how and what were the consequences of these extinctions on some of the surviving taxa. And because we have a radiocarbon date, we can also match it up with other records, climate records, um, that can tell us what was going on at that precise moment. So, so pulling this all together, um, there's a lot of cautionary lessons that we can learn. For example, the highly opportunistic dietary strategies of cougars didn't change over time and may have been key to their success. Um, coyotes, in fact, actually do change what they do. They become more opportunistic, and that may have been why they survived. Both of these, these animals essentially are able to eat smaller prey, and the smaller prey persists through this interval, which is, which is key. Um, and coyotes provide some evidence of what's called mesopredator release, um, where they are actually changing what they do in response to the other predators on the landscape. The other key take home is that apex predators are not immune to extinction. They are actually some of the most vulnerable if prey decline or their ability to hunt prey is impacted. And then lastly, uh, fossils provide critical insights regarding the ecology of species before uh, European arrival and can also clarify ecological niches prior to the um, Anthropocene. Some conservation messages is that climate change, including aridification, was a likely driver of these large animal extinctions. Again, apex predators are not immune to extinction. That's something we need to remember. And often it's the apex predators that are keeping the ecosystems in balance, that are making the ecosystems more resilient. So ultimately, what I wanna sort of share is that our past provides critical data that we can use to make informed decisions. However, it's really up to us um, to improve our future by acting on this knowledge. And with that, I just want to thank all of the following individuals who have helped. These are members of my lab, past and present. Um, I want to thank uh, different museums for allowing me access to specimens. I want to thank all of you for listening, um, folks from um, American Biology Teachers Association, uh, NCSE, um, and, and many others. And lastly, just some of the funding sources that have provided um, necessary resources. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. DeSantis. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed that as much as I did. Um, it's fascinating work that you're doing. It's so exciting that you're doing it in our own backyard, Labria being um, just a, a treasure trove. Um, we've had one question come in through the audience and they wanted you to explain how C13 is used to tell if the animals were eating C3 or C4 plants. Okay, great. Yeah, that's a fantastic question. So um, C3 plants and C4, C3 and C4 plants photosynthesize a little bit differently. Um, I like to use car analogy sometimes. Um, a C3 plant is kind of like your sta standard automobile. It works great most of the time, um, but if resources are limited, so if gas is limited, um, so if, for example, water is limited or if nitrogen is limited in the case of plants, um, an electric vehicle or a hybrid vehicle is may cost more, may require um, 
uh, various components, but it's going to be a bit more efficient um, when those resources are limited. So what's actually happening is um, essentially the C4 are the C4 plants are, are kind of like um, those doors in Chicago where, you know, you sort of open it, there's one set of doors and then there's another set of doors that actually makes your way into the office building. So it kind of regulates temperature. On some sense, you're actually, um, C4 plants are taking in um, CO2 and they're kind of saving some of that CO2 and converting it um, differently than the C3 plants. C3 plants are sort of leaving those stomata open all the time and sort of filtering you basically are constantly filtering that 13C versus 12C. So because of these different ways in which these, these plants photosynthesize, we get different amounts of 12C to 13C in these, in these different um, end members. Uh, also, there's things called cam plants, which are things like cactus that also kind of take in CO2 at one interval of time and then convert it much like C4 plants. Um, so because of this, we get these sort of different um, isotopic signatures. Awesome. Okay, well, we have one more. Um, are there any differences in isotope measurements taken between teeth versus various bones? Does one type of bone give a more reliable measurement? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Um, so bones and teeth are different in, in a few different ways. Um, teeth have more inorganic component. So enamel is really, um, it's less porous. And so it's less prone to what we call diagenetic alteration or alteration after the death of the animal. So typically enamel on teeth is sort of like the gold standard. Uh, we can go back and look at, you know, horse teeth from 55 million years ago um, that if we're looking at tooth enamel, bone is going to get altered over time. And so because of that is sort of less reliable over long periods of time. Now, that being said, bones and teeth can actually also tell us slightly something different if we're looking at um, bone collagen versus um, bone appetite uh, or enamel uh, or dentin collagen or enamel appetite. And those things have to do with either your whole diet or versus the protein components of your diet. So um, right now we're actually working on why do we get these two different sort of pictures of the diet of saber-toothed cats and dire wolves. And we thought, well, maybe we're picking from these from this population and other people are picking these bones from this other population. When we actually look at the enamel um, and then the bone from that same individual, we're still getting sort of different explanations. And so this may have to do with how nutrients are routed to tissues um, and which ones are sort of representing whole diet and protein components, but it's, it's something that we're actually still not, we still don't understand hundred percent and we're looking into in precise detail in modern animals so we can better calibrate our tools. Um, I really like this next question. If dire wolves lived in the grasslands and saber-toothed tigers live more in the forest, does their relative frequency in the tar pits match up with the pollen that was there too? Um, so if pollen indicated tar pit near forest, more saber tooths, if more grass pollen, more dire wolves, or can you not tell because it's hard to predict relative population sizes anyway? So that's a fantastic question. So people, there's actually paleobotanists um, at La Brea, a woman um, named Dr. Reagan Dunn, and she has been looking at everything from pollen to plant macrofossils to get a, a better grasp of the vegetative history um, in this area, which is really important to do from that perspective. One of the things that we've done is we have all of those um, radiocarbon dates of different specimens and we're now able to correlate those with a point in time. Well, there's a, a core, um, a lake core from not too far away that has pollen data. And so we can begin to say, okay, this saber-toothed cat that lived at this time period when there was lots of grass pollen or very little grass pollen or lots of, um, or the sh there was a um, lot of a, a much more chaparral type ecosystem, what, how are those things affecting these animals? So that's something that we're just starting to kind of um, look at and, and try to, try to assess. Um, many times I will say that in the conditions that preserve bones 
and what are called phytoliths are not the conditions that preserve pollen typically and vice versa. The conditions that preserve pollen tend to not preserve bones and phytoliths as regularly. So um, it's often very difficult to get pollen and bones from the same site. Okay, well, we have time for one more question. Um, and so um, Dr. DeSantis, I just realized you still have your slideshow up. Do you mind um, pulling oh, it Oh, yes, thank you. Stop, share, there we go. Okay, so our last question, um, I'm kind of going to combine this really quickly, but one person wanted to know, like, what type of teeth do humans primarily have? Is it anisotropic or, and then the other one wanted to, um, to know, can you correlate isotope data of fossil plants to your herbivores? Yeah, so, um, so in regards to humans, it, it's, it's variable, right? Our diets are, are very, are highly variable, but we can get lots of information from them. So for example, um, if you ate lots of sushi, we would be able to see from your different tissues, uh, high nitrogen value. So you might not have eaten lots of sushi as a child, or maybe you got into it later. And so I could look at your hair, right. And I could actually see when were you eating lots of fish or when were you maybe a vegetarian or a vegan? Um, and you could actually trace all of that in regards to the teeth. Um, there are different, we, I've been actually collaborating with some archeologists at Vanderbilt, um, a woman named Dr. Tef Tiffany Tung and, um, uh, Dr. Dillahay and one of the things that we've looked at is humans from a site called Waka Prieta and another sort of mounds called Peridones. And what we're actually finding is that um, is sort of when we can actually identify when you start to see an increase in maize consumption from the carbon isotopes. So the C4, C4 values, because corn is a C4 plant. Um, we can also see when sort of maybe the grinding of that maize was coming in um, because they, it leaves the, the process of actually grinding the maize leaves um, abrasives uh, in the, uh, the cornmeal and whatnot and can then result in having more scratchy teeth. And so um, there have been others who have looked at prehistoric populations of humans and been able to correlate um, whether it's the food items they eat or the way in which they prepare the food can have an influence on their microscopic wear patterns, which is which is really neat and something that we can take back further in time. Awesome. All right. Well, I wish we had more time um, to ask you more questions, Dr. DeSantis, but we would like to transition to sharing um, a pretty amazing lesson from an, a pretty amazing teacher ambassador who um, I'm going to introduce really quickly. Let me start sharing sc screen. Thank you so much. Yes, we greatly appreciate your presentation. All right, so I have the honor of introducing Jennifer Brew from um, the great state of Ohio today, and she is one of our excellent teacher ambassadors, and she's going to share with us a lesson that she helped develop with Dr. McFadden's lab who Dr. DeSantis actually worked with as an undergrad student. So there is a really strong tie between all of this work. Jennifer. All right, thank you. I'm so excited to be here um, and to share this lesson with you. Um, so I've been teaching for about 17 years now um, and currently I teach AP Bio, AP Environmental and Anatomy and Physiology at a small public high school um, outside of Cincinnati. But the lesson that I am about to share with you, I have used in all levels of biology classes. Um, so we want to actually start with a Slido. Um, so if you scan the QR code, you can join this poll um, and keep the Slido open for the rest of the presentation because we have a couple of questions that we want to get your thoughts uh, and opinions on. So go ahead and scan. Um, and the first question is, tell us where you're from. And don't forget, we're gonna have a prize drawing after all of um, the lesson presentation. I should have mentioned that before Jennifer got started. That is always important. <laughs> Some good stuff. 
All right, so maybe we can see the results of the first poll. All right, well, we might be having some technical difficulties, um, but to give you a little bit more background on this lesson, um, I worked with um, Dr. McFadden and a lot of his graduate students, um, and one of the reasons that I think this lesson is pretty awesome is that it's based on the actual science, and so, I mean, Dr. DeSantis's talk was was amazing, right, and fascinating. And I think that a lot of times students know when you're presenting them with the actual science um, versus, you know, using popsicle sticks or pom poms or simulations. I think you can get a lot more student buy in that way. Um, so, should we just go to the next slide, Lynn? Okay, so I think you're on actually question two in the Slido. Oh, nice. How many hours? Oh, look at all those awesome answers. Okay, it flashed up for a minute and I saw that a lot of people had the 16 or more hours, um, which is great. I could spend like a whole semester on evolution. I think it's definitely one of my favorite topics to teach. Um, and then the last question in the Slido is gonna ask about misconceptions that your students might come into class with. Um, and my hope is that this lesson will also help combat some of those misconceptions. All right. Yes, that is okay. <laughs> so I see the answers come in. My students also have all of these misconceptions as well. Um, and I think particularly that, you know, organisms are evolving because they want to evolve or that there's some ultimate goal. Um, so this is good to see that it's not just my students. All right, well, thank you for answering those, um, but let's get started. Uh, we'll jump right into the lesson. Um, And so this is actually um, what I'm gonna kind of showcase today is part of a lesson set sequence. Um, and so we're gonna start with the anchor today. Um, in part A, students kind of learn the nuts and bolts of evolution by using um, data from fossilized horse teeth. And then part B is an intraspecies investigation because we all know that genetic variation is the raw material. Uh, for natural selection. And so that drives home the, the importance of that, which leads into part C, where you apply um, the ideas of bottleneck effect and genetic drift to conservation. And again, highlighting the fact that that genetic diversity is gonna be key. Um, and then um, one of my favorite parts is part D, um, which is museum misconceptions, right? And uh, this is where students actually get to hopefully fix a problem that we see in a lot of museums that I will tell you about later. All right, so we're gonna start with the anchor. Um, oh, and also this was, so this is another, this is just a cute slide um, that again, I already told you this is authentic science. Like this, this was a true collaboration um, with everyone in Dr. McFadden's lab um, and lots of teachers and that students are observing actual horse fossils and this is my push, particularly for older students, and I have been guilty of this in the past, that, you know, I'm thinking, oh, well, they're, they're too big for fossils now. Um, and I happen to, you know, on Facebook and social media, you see all the pictures of kids when they're going back to school and, you know, they're starting kindergarten and first grade. And I swear, if you 50% of them say, I want to be a paleontologist, right? And so I think that paleontology is like our gateway science. And that even for our older kids, it's kind of important to, to bring back that curiosity to the classroom. And I hope that this lesson can do that. 
Um, and I think a great place to start is actually our anchor. And so if you look at this, this is um, an artist's reconstruction of what one of the earliest horses, Cyphrohippus, from about 55 million years ago, would have looked like standing nose to nose with a modern horse. Um, and then the second picture shows you the size of the early horses um, and that they were the size of a cat. Um, also just make sure that your students realize it's not a giant horse, that the horse is actually the size of the cat. Um, and so we have another Slido for you. And I wanna know, looking at these pictures, what questions does this bring up for you? Or what questions do you think that your students would have um, based on those two images? Yeah, that is mine. Like, also mine is like, what happened? Um, another one of my questions is like, can we do some de-extinction and I can have a little cyphrohippus that runs around my classroom and lives under my lab table? Yes, what made the horse change so much? Um, yeah, why did they get bigger over time? Uh, yes, all of these are awesome questions. Um, and I agree, the cyphrohippus is adorable. Um, and these are exactly the same questions that my students ask when we when we start this unit. Um, and I will say that in AP Bio, this is what I do on day two. Um, so this is how I, I start the year, because as we know, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. Um, and so going to the next slide, um, students are asked to look at a series of pictures. And if you scan the QR code on the screen, you can see pictures of the different epics that the horses lived in North America. Um, and I think it's important to emphasize to your students that this is North America. Horses are actually native to North America, which most people don't know. Um, I will say they did go extinct. Um, and the modern horses that we have were brought back over by Europeans. So just to, you know, some students get confused about that because there are still horses here. Well, those um, have been brought back over. And so as students examine the pictures of the different epics, we talk about what do they see? So what animals do they see? Uh, what plant life do they see? And then next slide, please. And then ultimately I make them focus in on the vegetation. Because if we're talking about an ecosystem, we know that plant life is the, you know, the basis for the ecosystem. Uh, we also knew horses are eating plants. And so what students see is that in the early um, epics, when the, the smaller horses lived, we see these lush forests with these nice C3, you know, softer leaves. And we see this gradual change of a mix to of forests and grasslands and to a lot of our C4 plants, right? And so the later pictures are almost all grasslands. And that's gonna be important at, um, observation for later, and also just to set the stage for students that the environment in North America where these horses um, were living has changed drastically over time. All right, next slide. And so then they're going to examine um, a set of fossil horse teeth. Um, the teeth are all the same tooth, but from different species of horses that existed in North America. And so students are going to take observation and then next slide or take measurements, I should say, and make observations. And there are actually three options um, as a teacher if you're going to use this lesson. So one, you could 3D print all of the replicas, which I know is a lot, but you do have them forever um, and it's not too expensive. All the files are available um, on the NCSE website for free, of course. Um, there are digital 3D models that we're going to check out um, in just a second. That's also a great alternative. Um, and if you don't have the technology or don't want to mess with it, there's also physical card sets. And both the digital 3D models and the card sets have measurements so that students can still kind of get the experience of collecting data um, and doing the basic calculations that the scientist actually did. So let's go to the next slide. And there will be a QR code. And if you scan that, 
it'll take you to the Sketchfab website that contain, and it'll take you to one particular um, set of, or one particular tooth, um, just so you can get an idea of what the students would see. And on the image, there are measurements because there are two measurements that were important um, for paleontologists when they're looking at teeth. Um, so one is called the crown height, which is basically how tall is the tooth. Um, and I, and as you can see here, this will be my one warning about Sketchfab. The files are amazing, but they do take a, a second to download. So depending on your school's internet connection, um, you probably want to check that out before you go, go live in the classroom. And then the other measurement is the APL or the anterior posterior length, which is kind of like the width of the tooth, right? Um, and so as students click on the buttons for each of the teeth, and I believe there's like 15 different species, somewhere between 15 and 17 different species for the students to collect data on, right? And they can rotate the teeth. So it's pretty cool. Um, all right. And then I think we went back to the Slido and the questions about the, uh, the horses. All right. Um, and so then another option, and this I just want to highlight for a second, because I think for teachers, this might be the most intimidating part of the lesson if you actually print the 3D teeth. Um, when you're measuring the teeth, the most important part is that you're looking for this ridge, right? And when you're calculating the or measuring the crown height, you just take the calipers and you just measure the length of that ridge just like that. And then to calculate the anterior posterior length, because the if I was a horse, the tooth would sit in my mouth like this, um, all the students have to do, and this is maybe the trickiest part, is just make sure that that ridge is in between the edges of the calipers. And those are the two numbers that they need. There is a video that walks you through that. Um, and the, the other secret is that as long as they're measuring consistently, usually the numbers will work out in the end, even if they aren't collecting perfect data. But they're going to use those two measurements to calculate something called the Hypsodonty index. And this is what they're going to, going to graph. Um, and so you can see that over time, when they graph all of this data, we see that the teeth go from very small Hypsodonty indexes, and very small teeth, to very large teeth, right? Okay, next slide. And so then the question is, okay, let's go back to the pictures from the beginning. Let's look at the vegetation and see if there's any relationship between those two things. Um, and so then if we go to the next slide, um, this is what I like to do. I like to actually bring in samples of grass, the ornamental, really long grass that's, you know, that everyone plants, at least here in Ohio, is great because you can actually feel the phytolus. You can feel the silica. Um, and then I like to collect some soft leaves from trees. And I have the students just grind them up with a mortar and pestle. Um, they'll be able to kind of grind the, the C3 leaves, the softer leaves. Um, the grass they'll hardly make any progress on. And I will yell at them the whole time, like you're starving, you have to be able to chew your food, you're starving, um, to try to get them to think about, hmm, what's the relationship here? And then if we go to the next slide, after kind of a series of questions, and I'll actually have them go back and shade in on their graph. What was the vegetation like during each time period these different species of horses live? And they then have to tell me what happened, right? Which is a lot of the, the first driving you know, questions that we get from the anchor. And so essentially the story is um, that, and, and we have to start over at 50 right, million years ago. So remember that zero is present day. Um, on the x-axis, which can be confusing for students sometimes. So I have had students where they do negative 55, and instead of starting at like zero, zero on the x-axis, they'll actually start at negative 55, because we tend to read from left to right. Um, so if we're looking at the shaded area of the green, that's the oldest species of horse on the graph that you're looking at. And we can see they have the very small 
Hypsodonty index when the climate was mainly, the vegetation was mainly forests. And then if, as we move forward in time or closer to present day at zero, we see that the teeth got bigger as we had a shift from these soft, easy to chew leaves to these really tough grasses. And from there, students are kind of guided through this idea that if you, you know, had the stronger, longer teeth and you could get more nutrition, you could reproduce more and your genes would be represented in the next generation. And that this is how this change in the horse population starts to take place over time, right? And you can see exactly how this relates to what Dr. DeSantis just talked to us about. Um, which is, you know, really cool. Again, this is this is real science. This is real information um, that, and you know, real fossils that scientists have used to learn this information. Um, and then, um, skipping ahead to the end of all of the lessons, um, is this idea of museum misconceptions. Um, and so, students are given these horse cards, and um, just for time, we can go to the next slide. And this is all about getting students to think phylogenetically versus orthogenetically. Uh-oh, my classroom is telling me to go home. <laughs> Sorry about that. And the lights are on a timer. Um, but anyway, so, um, and I do have a quick Slido question. Has anyone seen the sign um, on the slide, right? Um, because I, these just popped up about three weeks ago. I pass one of them on the way to work. And every time I look at it, I think, ugh, orthogenetic evolution. Oh my gosh. Okay, let's see. So is it not just Ohio? Okay, well maybe maybe it's, yeah. I guess it's good that it's not, not a majority, but I'm also not alone. Um, and every time I look at that sign, I just think, oh, this is a horrible representation of evolution. It leads to so many misconceptions. Um, and instead, I want to see things like the Smithsonian um, that's from the Hall of Human Origins, which is a wonderful exhibit if you ever get the chance um, to visit. All right, uh, let's go to the next slide. So students are given this task. They actually read um, the actual scientific paper that Dr. McFadden wrote where he went around to museums around the country. And these are some of the best museum, best natural history museums like the Smithsonian, American Museum of Natural History. And he graded their horse exhibits, right? On the evolution of the horse. And he found that 55% of them depicted the evolution of the horse in North America as that straight line orthogenetic evolution. And so students read this paper and we talk about, well, what kind of misconceptions does that lead to? That, that you know, evolution is goal-directed. A lot of the misconceptions that you indicated your students had at the beginning of this presentation. Um, that, you know, evolution, you know, only one species could be alive at a time and one species turns into another species. And so then students get a letter from Dr. McFadden um, that I may or may not have written. And it says, you know, I need help we need to fix these museum exhibits. Um, and so if we go to the next slide. I actually use this as kind of a summative evaluation. And so students get horse cards that correlate with all of the different teeth that they've already been working with all along. And their task is design a museum exhibit that tells the story of the horse in North America, that tells the story of evolution. Right. And we talk about how in the paper that McFadden wrote, it, it you know talks about that it's expensive, that the average museum visitor only looks at a museum exhibit for like five minutes. Um, and this is their final challenge. And I know that if students can um, create a phylogenetic exhibit, and sometimes I even have them do a flip grid to go along with this, where they have to explain the story of the horse, um, that they are that they're on their way to mastering. Um, their understanding of evolution. So thank you. Oh, Lynn, I think you're muted. 
Okay, so let me try that again. So thank you so much, Jennifer, for your presentation. We are so honored at NCSC to have um, Jennifer work with us as a teacher ambassador and to share that amazing resource with us. Um, we also, both TJ and I, wanted to remind you all that Baltimore is not that far away. Um, I know it seems like a while till we'll be in fall, but can we already believe we're talking about the end of the school year? So um, TJ, with that being said, um, we have time for a drawing. Great, I'm excited. 